Hey Freunde der Teewelten, Silly Huhn wieder hier am Stissel ähm, auf Laser Guckenland, dem Vanilla Minecraft Anarchie Server mit der IP 1492127134. Ähm, und wir pumpen heute den DEFCON 23 Talk von Patrick Wadle, DLL Hijacking on OS X, das ist von 2015, also mal sehen, wie aktuell das noch ist. Und äh, ja, wir, wir reisen jetzt los und. Ähm, ja. Genau. Und äh, wir reisen jetzt äh, in, äh, in ferne Länder. Oh mein Gott, also das mit nach hinten schauen habe ich gar nicht drauf. I'm talking about pushing, I'm talking about intercepting function calls and following a hook or a libra. A Trojan is a malicious program, something that pretends to be legitimate. Injection is all about getting code into a Oh my god. And then finally, a backdoor is code that provides undetected uh, remote control. Let us mal the uh, x-axe merken. Right, die is so minus 200. We're going to start with a brief overview of DLL hijacking on Windows. Before the talk is then we'll be talking about dialed hijacking on LSS. We're going to look at the features in the loader and linker that allow us to realize this attack. And then we're going to talk about how to find vulnerable applications that we can hijack. And then we're going to actually walk through some hijack examples because there's some nuances getting these all work. And then finally we're going to end with some tax and empathy. So first let's briefly talk about DLL hijacking on Windows. The reason we talk about this first is because it's conceptually very similar to dialect hijacking on OSX. It's also well understood. And finally, there's real-life examples we can look at of DLL hijacking that illustrate the gravity of this kind of attack. <gasps> Nicole. So most of you are probably familiar with DLL hijacking on Windows. Basically, starts with an application that specifies just a name to a DLL instead of a fully qualified path. This makes the application vulnerable. Why? Well, it turns out when only a name is provided, the Windows loader will look in various application directories before looking in the system directory. So this is conceptually how it all works. We have an application that says, hey, I have a dependency on blah.dll. The loader says, OK, you didn't give me a full path, so I'm going to look in several directories for this DLL. I'm going to start with the current working directory or the applications directory before then going to look in the system. So what a malicious adversary or malware can do is plant a malicious DLL in that primary search directory, and then whenever that application is started, the loader will be tricked or coerced into using the malicious DLL. Now there was a lot of hype around DLL hijacking, a lot of media when it was first publicly discovered in 2010. And this is because it was very useful for malicious adversaries and malware. Uh, so using DLL hijacking, you can do a variety of things. You could persist without touching the registry. All you have to do is plant a malicious DLL. And that was the crafting mention. You could also do a uh, low time processing. Uh, yeah. So if an application, say a browser, was vulnerable to DLL hijacking, you could just plant a malicious DLL, and every time the browser would be started, your DLL will get loaded into the context of the browser. It was also used to bypass UAC. There's some applications on Windows that are auto UAC, which means when they're executed, they are automatically elevated without having put in a username and password. If these applications are vulnerable to a DLL hijack, again, an attacker can plant a malicious DLL and then execute these applications, and their DLL will also be auto elevated into the context of that process. And then finally, there were some aspects where this could be used for remote infection, where if an attacker could get a user to load some oh, remote web data share, they could also get Oder? a malicious Warte, DLL have loaded from that remote share. Have I got a shift seen? So here are some sign? brief real life nee. examples of DLL hijacking. The first is persistence. There's a blog written by Mandy, and they talked about all these unrelated samples of malware they found that were all called fxt.dll. Yeah, here's the truth. Huh. They were all in C slash Windows. They looked a little deeper into this, and they found out that explore.exe was vulnerable to a DLL hijack attack. Basically, if you plant a DLL with that name in C Windows, every time Explorer starts, which is automatically when the computer reboots, your malicious DLL will get loaded. 
So this is a really great way to persist without having to modify the registry. The second example is Privesk. Sysprep.exe uh, is one of those auto UAC applications, and it was vulnerable to a DLL hijack. So here's some source code from some, some malware that actually was abusing this to bypass UAC. It would plant a malicious DLL and then programmatically start um, sysprep.exe, which would load the attacker's DLL into its auto UAC uh, process. So where does DLL hijacking stand today? Well, Microsoft fairly rapidly responded. They patched a lot of applications by specifying the Fully qualified app. Yeah, so keine they Ahnung. They also set some registry keys that would help control the loader, so maybe it wouldn't be coerced or tricked as much. I thought it was pretty much done and gone, but when I was working on these slides about two weeks ago, uh, there was a security advisory released by Microsoft that they had to repatch one of their applications because it was still vulnerable to this DLL hijacking attack. So this shows the longevity and bodes well for an attacker who can find a similar attack on the so uh, about six months ago, I was reading Stack Overflow because I do some programming at work, and this is how I code. I just go to Stack Overflow and see what other people. Uh, this do. is how everybody and codes. I by this guy named Mark Key. So right. Mark I hope. Is, whoever he is, I totally own the beer because he kind of piqued my interest and said that any OS that does dynamic library loading is theoretically vulnerable to uh, DLL hijacking. So today, I want to talk about dilute hijacking on OS X. Now, first, you might be thinking, why are attacks on Mac? You know, a big deal. Well, this is kind of an obvious statement, but Macs are pretty much everywhere. You look around at a security conference, college campuses, R&D centers, board meetings, you know, everyone uses Macs. And of course, we all know, anytime a technology becomes more prevalent, attacks become more valuable and more destructive. All right, so the previous terms I defined were kind of funny. These ones are a little more serious, um, but equally important. So when I'm talking about Mach-O, this is the executable for format that Apple uses. So Windows has PE Mac files, o. Linux has L files, Macs have ich hätte das nie das. Dialids are simply dynamic shared libraries. Again, Windows has DLLs, Linux has .SOs, Macs have dialids. And then finally, load commands. Nie so ausge commands are embedded uh, in these Mac-O binaries, and as their name suggests, they are commands to the loader. So they do things like specify the memory layout, the initial execution thread of the main... Irgendwie triggert das mein OCD, dass wir so weit weg sind, so weit links. Very important because they specify dependencies on dialogues that were... Weil einfach gerade ausgehen, weil wenn man stirbt, dann findet man es besser wieder, ne? Das ist Bescheid. Kommen wir da besser rum oder da? Scharf. And you can view them with tools such as mock OView or OTool. One of the most important dial, uh, load commands for this presentation is the LC load dialog load command. Basically, there's one for each dialog that an application has a dependency for. So this is kind of like an entry in the IET on Windows. Basically, it tells the loader, hey, I have a dependency. Please go find that dialog and load it into memory. So let's take a closer look at this dialog, uh, this load command. So it starts with the standard load command header, which has the command number and the command size because it can be very building. And then it has a dialog structure. This dialog structure has a name, which is usually a full path, and then some versioning information. Now there's another important load command called the LC ID dialog load command. And this actually shares Fair the same format as the LC load dialog load command. And the reason why is it's because it's complementary. So applications have the LC load dialog load command, which tells the loader they have a dependency. And what the loader does is Fuck. it goes and finds that dialog, and then in the dialog it looks for the dialog LC ID load command and makes sure they just match. So that's why they have the same format. Here are locker schon jemand, oder? All right, so back to dialog hijacking. Let's yeah. specify exactly what we're trying to do. We want to be able to plant or drop a malicious dialog and then have it be automatically loaded by a vulnerable application. Now, let's put some constraints on this. So, obviously you could achieve this by patching the binary, putting in a new dependency, but this is going to break the digital signature, makes it pretty easy. Okay. We also are going to say no other modifications to the operating system. So no modifications, we'll auto-run, plus files, anything like this. Again, Bada. just plant a file on the file system. That's all we're allowed to do. Again, we also Akure, want to be independent of the user's environment. So we're not going to modify any path variables or environment variables. If we could find such an attack on OSX that is simply dropping a dialog and getting it loaded by vulnerable applications, it would be quite powerful. And we'd be able to abuse it for attacks that were similar to DLL hijacking. So we could gain persistence, load time process injection, bypass security products, and maybe even open some avenues to facilitate remote infection. 
So I'm gonna DLL hijacking was all about abusing logic in the loader. So let's start by looking at OSX's dynamic loader and linker, which is called BYLD. Basically, when an application starts, the loader does a few things. And these are similar to what loaders on other operating systems do. They're going to parse the application they're loading, look for the dependencies, go and find those dependencies on disk, load them into memory, Ooh. and then link so that the application uses. Again, this is pretty standard loader linker stuff. If we take a little bit of a closer look, we can see exactly what DYLD is doing. So when a new process is started, the Ooh. first code that executes in user mode in that newly born process is DYLD underscore start. Er geht aber auch schon wieder gut zurück auf Kurs. Ah, richtiger Boot Main. Ich sollte mal. Ja, nee, kein Bock jetzt hier auf Boot machen. Oh, die ist Moves. Fuck. Which actually loads the dialog into memory and does all the thinking. So that's a brief overview of DYLD. So let's talk about finding some logic that we can abuse. <laughs> Schwein. So basically, we want to look for two scenarios. Can First I just? Scenario oh, we're fuck. For, is there code within the loader that doesn't error out if the dialog is not found? And in the second scenario, oh, is, for, is there code again within the loader that looks for dialogs in multiple locations? In either case, if the answer is yes, we may be able to hijack via dialog hijack. Why? Well, think about the first scenario. There is an instance where an application has a dependency and that dependency is not found. <laughs> Dieses Slot im Inventar saving. Kann ich damit essen? Um, Wenn ich so auf ein anderes Ding gehe. In multiple places for the dialogs to load and the legitimate dialog is not in one of the primary locations it's loading. Again, we may be able to plant or save a malicious dialog in that primary search location and then shirk the loader into Oh my god, ich habe gar nichts mitbekommen von dem Talk bisher. Ich weiß nicht, wie es bei euch geht, aber irgendwie ist es auch wieder so einer der Talks, wo man eher aktiv aufpassen sollte. Oh lol, der hat sogar einen Code-Sample da. Also, naja, ihr werdet wahrscheinlich auch wenig verstehen. So we have to go to the do get dependent libraries method to see what sets this required variable. We can see some code that's iterating over various load commands, and we can see logic for the LC load dialog, which we talked about. And there's a new dialog, uh, a new load command called LC load weak. If the load command is this new LC <laughs> Here, uh, privacy weak, MB. that required variable is set to false, which is good. That means the exception is going to be avoided. Pretty much it says that dialog is not there, no harm done. So by abusing these weak dependencies, this is our <laughs> Schwein. scenario. So here's a normal scenario. You have an application that has a weak dependency. The loader is going to go and try to find that dialog, but if that dialog is not there, the application is like, okay, I would have used it if it was there, but if it's not, no problem. So what a hacker can do is obviously plant a malicious dialog in that location. Die ja, killt er überhaupt irgendwas, oder ist das so ein veganer Pazifist hier? Now that's the first method. I wanted to keep looking to see if I could find the second method, because the first one wasn't as common as I would have thought. So auditing the code again uncovered a loop. Basically, it was trying to load dialogs for multiple R path locations. We can basically see there's an inner loop, which is a vector of paths, and it's trying each of these paths and seeing if it can find the dialog in each of these paths. So I had no idea what functionally this was doing, but luckily Apple explains. So there's two parts to these R paths, one path dependent dialog. Wow, these moves, path man. A run path dependent these is moves. simply a library that doesn't know where it's going to end up on the target system when it's installed. The second piece are applications that link against the run path dependent values. Okay, ich sag mir mal F5 Rebind. Wow, oh, das geht ja gar nicht. Ich bin ja schnell mit umdrehen. So this is exactly what happens. Now, I guess this makes it easier to deploy software, but from an attacker's point of view, we can see this and say, oh, DYLD is basically going to look for dialogs in multiple locations. Ich habe ich keinen Stein mehr. Das ist natürlich kritisch. So this is a walk where we're going to build a run path dependent library, and then we're going to create an example application that links against these libraries, that then we'll use to hijack. 
So it's pretty easy to make a run path dependent library. It's, just, it's a normal dialog, except in the install directory, you put the special keyword that. Okay, so I have no more blocks. So you then compile this dialog and dump its load command. You can see the LCID dialog, which is the load command that tells or identifies the dialog to the loader. You can see that its name, which is a path, actually starts with this special keyword. Rip, ah, yeah. Und drei Blöcke. Ah, mich fuckt's ab, dass ich keine Blöcke mehr habe. Okay, dann waste mir halt ein bisschen Holz für Building Blocks. Eigentlich sollte ich mal den Talk switchen, weil das gerade ziemlich useless ist, aber... Ja. Oh mein Gott, das Gebirge sieht übel aus. Oder dieser Berg. Ah, ich kann da echt essen. Okay, cool. Oh. Oh, wow, das sieht ja crazy aus da hinten. What it's going to do is it's going to look for all dependencies that start with that at r path keyword. Then what it's going to do is it's going to swap out that at r path keyword and put in one of the search directories, check if the dialog is there. If it is, it's happy. If not, it's going to iterate to the next search directory to look for the dialog. <laughs> so here's hijack number two. Kohle. Ich habe keine Fackeln. Zwei Kohle, nice. Irgendwann, wenn ich dann voll desperate bin, kann ich mir eine Fackel bauen. Okay, wir sind ein bisschen links abgedriftet. Nun! First, if an application has a weak dependency, that that dependency is not there, we can plan a malicious pilot. Or if an application contains multiple run path search directories, and the run path dependent library, the legitimate one, is not in one of the primary directories, again, we can plan a malicious pilot in the initial directory, and it'll get loaded automatically. All right, so now it's time to actually perform hijack. We're going to use the example application. Ooh, fine. This dependency on the run path dependent. So the first thing you should do is confirm that it's actually vulnerable. So the loader has various environment variables that you can set that basically tell it to do more logging, tell you what exactly is doing. So if we set the dyld print r pass environment variable, this will print all the information that the loader is trying to do as it tries to find these files. Ja, ich weiß, ich crafte immer wieder ein Boot, aber... ...first tried to look in the initial search directory and didn't find the dialog there. So then it went and looked in the second directory and it found the dialog there, so it's Ah ja, was sagen die Chords? Ein bisschen nach rechts driven noch. Da ist ein Boot da unten. So we plant our malicious dialog in the primary run path search directory. We start the application and good news, bad news. Good news, the loader seems to have found it and tried to load it. Bad news, the app 
horribly crashes. Luckily, though, there's a pretty verbose error message that kind of says exactly what's going on. So we go look at the source code to see where this error message is from. Basically, we can see that within the recursive load libraries method, it's going to check that the version of the dialib that it's about to load matches the version that the application has a dependency on. This makes sense. If an application, say, has a dependency on a dialib and says, hey, I need at least version X, if the dialib that the loader loads is less than version X, the loader's going to crash and basically say, hey, I couldn't fulfill the dependency for you. So, wenn ich dann mal irgendwo desperate bin und Fackeln brauche, ne, weiß Bescheid. Oh, warte, ich kann noch einfach reinschauen. Und so kann ich den Scheiß nicht öffnen. Oh, es laggt. Oder? Malicious dialog, again, copy it back to the prime and run past search directory, execute the application again, crashes again. Different error message, though. It says, hey, you don't have the symbols I require. Again, this makes total sense. Applications have the Ja, Bücher sind eigentlich ziemlich nice. Die sind, ähm, das yes, Papier können wir eher kriegen. In our hijacker dialog that we just copied in, we didn't export any symbols. So again, the loader's going to be like, Ah, warte mal, ich mach mal eben eine Tür. Der arme Boy muss da oben warten. Um, ich, ich weiß nicht, ja. Äh, ja, hier lassen, alles hier lassen, ne? So ideally, it would be way better if in our malicious hijacker dialog, we could just point to the legitimate dialog that we're, ha we're hijacking and tell the loader, hey, I don't have this in the world. There was someone, someone who does. And then as we hijack different applications, we could just update our malicious hijacker dialog to keep pointing to the correct legitimate dialog that we're hijacking. Turns out that in OSX, you can actually do this. There's some linker flags you basically have passed. Pass. And this creates a new load command, the LC re-export dialog load command. Again, this tells the linker, I don't have the symbols, but this guy or girl, this other dialog has the correct symbols, so go get them from there. There's two issues, though, that both deal with LD, which is the compile time linker. The first is when you specify this uh, export dependency, the compile time linker goes and gets the name of the legitimate, uh, legitimate dialog that you're re-exporting to. Since this is a run path dependent dialog, its name is going to start with this at r Now, this is only a problem because when the linker, the runtime linker, sees this LC re-export dialog load command, it doesn't actually resolve that at R path keyword. It doesn't treat it special. So it just tries to go to the file system and look for a dialog that starts with at R path, which obviously is not going to exist. The other problem is LD, again, the compile time linker, will not allow you to link against or re-export to another dialog if that dialog is a system dialog under, uh, under a, a, an umbrella framework which a lot of the ones that we have hijacked are. So we can get around this by just linking against a fake dialog. This will allow us to compile, and then we can patch or fix up this LC re-export uh, re dialog load command so that it points to the correct dialog. Turns out there's an Apple tool to do this. It's the install name tool. And basically, you give it a few parameters. You give it the existing name or value in the LC re-export dialog load command. You give it the new value, which again, this is the full path to the legitimate dialog that we're hijacking, and then the path to our own hijacking dialog. And then when we run this, you can see in the slide, it's uh, going to fully update the LC re-export dialog. So that'll point to the correct dialog that we are hijacking, which contains all the symbols that the application needs. Oh, warte. So we take this built Falsche Richtung, ne? Copy it again back into the primary <laughs> search directory, execute the application, and it finally works. Basically, our malicious dialog is automatically loaded and executed. All symbols are re-exported to the legitimate dialog so that the application runs and the user doesn't see anything fishy going on. All right, so now let's talk about some attacks and some success. The attacks we're going to highlight, in my opinion, are pretty damaging and allow us to achieve all these cool hacks and, and malicious activities by simply planting the system. Ooh, the spooky. Um, also, it's unlikely to be patched out because we're abusing the legitimate functionality of the uh, OS exploiter. And it's also unlikely to be detected by security products because the problem is the loader is doing the one that's loading the malicious library. So that's, again, kind of 
Um, we're just abusing legitimate techniques, so that's hard for security products to detect and handle. So first I want to talk about automation. So in order to do this dialed hijack attack, you have to have a vulnerable application. You can't indiscriminately just target any application. So I wrote a little script that basically scans the, uh, either your running processes or all files on the file system and looks for applications that are vulnerable to either of the two hijack scenarios we described. And we can see that it found about 150 binaries on my box. So that's good. There's a lot of targets we can go after. Now, I can't list them all, but these are some of the ones, uh, maybe some of the more well-known ones. You can see Apple has a whole list. Uh, Third-party applications like Microsoft have a whole bunch. This is a little funny because all their Office products were vulnerable to DLL hijacking on Windows. They're also vulnerable to Dialog hijacking on OS X. And then a lot of third-party ones like Google, Adobe, PGD Tools, Dropbox. We can hijack any of these applications. Also recall, talking a little bit more about automation, that in order to successfully hijack an application, we had to craft a dialog that had the correct version number and also re-exported the symbols to the correct dialog that we were hijacking. And this was a kind of a pain to do manually. So again, I wrote a script that basically takes a generic hijacker dialog and configures it for the Ooh, is that land? Or is this the so answer? Yeah. Application you're trying to hijack, you just run the script and it'll configure mm. the hijacker dialog so it's fully compatible so that your hijack mm. will work. Mm. Right, so I'm going to talk about persistence first. This is probably one of the best uses of attack. Again, our goal is to gain automatic and persistent code execution by simply dropping a dialog to this. All we're going to do. Benefits of this, again, there's no binary or OS modifications. We're not breaking any digital signatures. We're not modifying any key lists or auto run locations that might be monitored. There's also going to be no new processes. Our dialog, our malicious dialog, is going to get loaded into an uh, existing process. So the user's not going to see any new malicious processes running if they do a PS or check out uh, activity monitor. Mm. Also, it's going to be hosted within a trusted process. This is good because a lot of times trusted process, processes are allowed to do more things than untrusted processes. And again, it abuses legitimate functionality. Anytime you have an attack that abuses the legitimate functionality, it means it's probably going to be harder to patch and detect. All right, so on my box, there is an application called the iCloud Photo Stream Agent. It's uh, Apple daemon. It gets automatically run whenever the operating system starts. Oh, so it's so bad. And it turns out it's vulnerable to a dialog hijack. So what we can do is configure our malicious dialog so it's compatible with um, iCloud Photo Stream. Ah, oh, fuck. Ich hasse diese Bugs. Also mit Flüssigkeiten arbeiten irgendwie seit den neuen Microversionen. Buggy is fuggy. Nee, oder? Das ist doch generiert. An external monitoring component that's waiting for your target box, that's, for example, the user browser. And then as soon as that browser comes up and you want to inject code into it, you allocate some memory, you copy in some shell code, you spawn a new thread. This works, but it's kind of noisy and a little bit complicated and easy to detect. Dialog hijacking can achieve the same kind of thing, code execution within a target process, without any of these uh, downsides. So Xcode is an attractive target for malware because I think malware could use it to infect all deployed binaries, kind of as a yeah, a propagation center. So Xcode is the Apple IDE, it's what developers use to build applications. I thought it'd be really cool if there is malware that's running within the context of Xcode's process, it's basically watching for a release build, and as soon as the developer builds that release build, the malware could either subvert the source code or actually at the compiler level inject some malicious code so that, that now the release binary is infected and as it goes out, it will propagate the malware. So it turns out that Xcode is vulnerable to a dialog hijack. So again, we can customize, configure a malicious dialog, simply save it to the file system. That's all we have to do. Now, every time Xcode is started, our malicious dialog will get automatically loaded by the loader into Xcode's process space. If you can't trust the compiler, you should, you should pretty much just go home. <coughs> dialog hijacking is to bypass security products. Uh, again, the goal here is we want to do something that normally would be blocked or disallowed. Um, there are a lot of ways to maybe individually attack a personal security products, but dialog hijacking provides kind of a nice generic way to bypass security Good, that's why it's a flop. So let's talk specifically about okay. Linux. Okay. This is the de facto firewall oh. for OS X. I run it on my box, and what it does is anytime there's a new outgoing untrusted connection, it pops up and says, hey, do you want to trust this connection from process, you know, XYZ. The 
problem or the approach that Lewis Finch takes is it's kind of binary. It trusts known processes and also allows users to create blanket rules. So while my box, the GPG keychain, is allowed to create any outgoing connection. This makes sense to GPG keychain. Ah, dieser scheiß Schnee. Der fuck me up, ey. The problem is, GPG keychain is vulnerable to a dialect hijack. So what this means is we can plant a malicious dialect oh. and then every time GPG keychain is started, either Irgendwie bin ich noch ein bisschen am Struggle mit dem Switchen. Or by the user, the malicious dialect will get automatically loaded and executed and now be in the, the trusted process context of GPG keychain. And then the malicious dialect yeah, will cool. create an outgoing connection to um, the network uh, endpoint at once, the command and control server, you know, anywhere else. Im Bett ist auch gut. Na ja, gut, kann ich jetzt nicht aufsammeln. Basically, every time you download content from the internet, this content gets tagged with a quarantine attribute. And then when you go to run that application, so you, you know, double click it on your desktop, Gatekeeper will first intercept this request the first time and make sure that the application you're about to run conforms to the system settings. So you can see on the slide, you can set Gatekeeper to various settings, the highest being only allowed code from the Mac app store. This means if you download code from anywhere else inside the Geht jetzt wirklich da rein, wo ich schon drin war? Scheint so. Which is okay, except if the application loads that external content. So this is what we're going to do in three steps. I guess we only need two. Uh, first, we're going to find an Apple signed or a Mac App Store approved application that contains an external relative reference to a hijackable dialog. We're then going to create the necessary zip package, DMG package installer, or inject into a legitimate dialog and build the uh, folder structure necessary to execute this. So let's talk about these steps. So first we need to find a gatekeeper approved application with an external relative reference to a hijackable dialog. It's got to be external, external because we can't modify the application bundle. Gatekeeper is verifying that. If you touch that at all, it's going to break it and gatekeeper will not allow it to execute. However, the content has to be externally relative because we want to be able to put it within the same zip file, within the same DMG image. So instruments... Oh, da hinten ist noch ein Dorf. So you can see it. that it is verifiable, accepted by gatekeepers and Apple signed binaries. So gatekeepers like, even if you download from the internet and I have only allowed from the Mac App Store, I will allow you to run this application. And if we don't, it's load fans. We can see it has an LCR path that's relative externally to the application bundle. This is because the instrument expects to be un uh, installed under Xcode.application. So at runtime, it kind of goes off into Xcode's shared framework directory and looks for shared dialogs there. But we can use this. So now let's create a DMG and we can also create a zip file or inject this into a legitimate download if it's over HTTP. So at the top you can see there's instruments.app, it's under the applications directory. And then there's the external folders that instruments.app will look for for dialogs to load. Now if we provide a user with this DMG image, they're going to be like, what is this? Where do I click? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to run this. So we can take some steps to clean this all up. We can hide these files and folders. We can set a top level alias that points directly to instruments.app. We can change the icon, we can change the background. Again, we can modify all of this because we're not modifying the digital signature of instruments.app itself. So, you know, if you're downloading a flash installer, a legit flash installer over HTTP, and this is what you get, you're probably going to run it. All right, so this is how uh, this all happens. So, again, we have Mac gatekeeper settings, and they only allow code from Mac. And then we have this malicious DMG that has our unsigned malicious dialog, which should not be able to execute because it's not for the Mac App Store. And then uh, instrument file. So when the user clicks it, they'll get a standard pop-up. This is the standard. Oh, that's enough good out here. Any content you download from the internet. No. Even if it's signed, validated, you're just going to be like this is from the internet. 
you should probably click like, okay because they just downloaded some software that they want to run. And if they do, even though Geek Career Sets only allow code from the Mac App Store, it will actually load our malicious unsigned title because it doesn't check for that. Apple actually cached this, so we're safe now. I'll give you my first CD key, which I'm kind of stoked about. But this was problematic until they cached it because this allowed hackers to kind of go back to their old tricks and infect, uh, get users to download uh, malicious software and infect themselves. So the way most uh, hackers, uh, you know, non-nation state people target Mac users is by getting people to download malicious software. So you go to a website, it tells you there's uh, some HD codec you gotta install. Uh, you have to download um, some, you know, flash installer, stuff like that. Ja, von Master Talk 15, also ein Flash Installer gibt es ja wohl heutzutage nicht mehr. Go get the software from the company's website. So if you want to download Photoshop, you can go to Adobe.com, Microsoft Word, you go to Microsoft.com. And this is problematic if this software is distributed over HTTP, because what this means is now a nation state adversary or an adversary that has network level access can inject malicious code into these downloads, and Gatekeeper will no longer detect that they have been tampered with. Now you might be thinking, 2015, how much yeah. software is really distributed over HTTP? So when I was doing this research earlier this year, I looked at my doc and about two-thirds of the software that I installed on my computer had been distributed to me over HTTP. And I might be thinking, all right, Patrick, you are a malware analyst, security guy, you're probably downloading a lot of random tools from random third-party sites. Not too surprising that it's over HTTP. So I said, all right, fair enough, let me look at security. Leader, boy, this brauche ich bald, aber... Nee. How do you think right? Well, it turns out, again, when I did this research earlier this year, every single third-party security product that I downloaded was downloaded over HTTP. So again, this means any network level adversary could have easily intercepted this download, injected malicious content, and now a gatekeeper would not flag that the binary had cool. Also diese Dörfer sind ja alle ziemlich wack. Das muss man noch ehrlich mal sagen. So I built a, a proof of concept piece of malicious code that was distributed as a malicious DMG or zip file, or it could be injected to a legitimate download if it was over HTTP. When executed, it would persist uh, as a DNS download pipe down. With that exfiltrate some data to a command and control server. Okay, we're going to be good off, uh, of course, of 200. Yeah, this isn't the most sophisticated piece of malware, but I think it represents well what most malware yeah. is. Schwein! Persist, exfil, download, and execute. Also, you don't need root to install this. So then I wanted to test this against these third-party security groups. And the test, I thought, was simple but realistic. We download the security product over HTTP, update it so it had the latest signatures, and then I would down, I would run my downloaded.png image to see if the anti product or the firewall detected the attack. And I skewed the test towards the third-party security products by saying if they detected any component of the attack, that was a win for the antivirus product or the firewall, a loss for the malware. So if they detected the gatekeeper bypass, they detected the persistence, they detected the exfiltration of data, the download, the execute of command, any of those detections would be a win for the antivirus company. Now, probably not too surprising to you guys, none of them detected any of this. So again, this really just kind of re-exposes the might and the ineptitude of an entire industry that unfortunately charges us for the cost. All right, so pretty much things are kind of broken. So I wanted to briefly talk about some suggested things. First, since dialect mm. is legitimate. Uh, it's just, yeah, okay. Das andere ist food. Aber. Aber. Tür. Okay, er hat schon eingesammelt. Dann behalte ich die Tür. So, you know, I'm giving a talk actually tomorrow about the third escalation and Apple patch and how it would bypass the patch. Again, with the gatekeeper patch, there's other, other avenues to still coerce gatekeeper to run unsigned code. Demonstrated this at Black Hat a few days ago, even on LCAP and Hat. So hopefully, I've talked to Apple about this, hopefully they fix this as well. So it's improving, uh, slowly. And also, if software is downloaded over HTTP, let the company mm -hmm. know, like, write them, be like, why are you distributing software to me over HTTP? 2015, right, if you ask So I really want to talk about LFX, LCAP and Hat. Uh, I was 
hoping that that dialogue hijacking would be addressed. Unfortunately, though, even though there's all these new security mitigations, uh, well, at least according to Apple marketing, dialogue hijacking is lagging well. So what I did was I scanned the system, I found some vulnerable applications, and I was able to find a malicious unsigned dialogue, and now every time the operating system was started, the malicious dialogue was still loaded. Uh, Apple specifically says that code injection into system binaries is no longer permitted. But using dialogue hijacking, you can still get malicious unsigned code into one of those applications. So, I don't know, I don't know if I'll fix this, but that is what it is. So it looks like this attack, unfortunately, will be around for a while. So I decided to release a tool that can at least help us locally. So DHS, dialogue hijacking, basically will scan your running processes for your entire file system, and it'll tell you two things. It'll tell you if there's any vulnerable applications. Now, there's probably going to be a lot of vulnerable applications. This doesn't mean you're hacked or hijacked, this means if malware were to infect your system, it could find a malicious dialogue and only have to do that and then it could get code execution or get that dialogue loaded automatically by the operating system. It'll also show you hijacked applications. These are applications that appear to be hijacked. Now there's some oh. positive, so if you find this, you don't freak out too much. Um, I've yet to see any malware abusing this technique. But this will detect all the attacks I talked earlier where if someone does plant a malicious dialogue to hijack a legitimate one, this tool will detect that. This tool is available for free uh, at objectivesc.com, and it's my free uh, personal OSX security website. There's a nice question Was? about malware. Objectivesc.com is the sign website that stops over there, man. I find it's kind of hard to get the AD companies to share malware with me. Um, so I spent a lot of time kind of getting this collection together so you can download. There's also some free tools that I run on my personal computer. I love my Mac, but in my opinion, it's really easy to hack. So I kind of basically just wanted to write some tools to protect it and then make them available for free. So the first tool is knock knock. This is simply auto runs for OSX. It'll show you all software that's automatically persisting. Task Explorer, it's pretty much like Process Explorer. Uh, this is internal tools for Windows. It shows you all the running tasks. If they're signed, it has virus total integration, allows you to see loaded dialysts, so it will show any of these injected uh, hijacked dialysts, network connections, open files. And then finally, block block. Block block is simply a firewall for persistent auto run location. So it will monitor the, the file system, and if malware tries to persist or install itself, it will detect it. All right, so wrapping this all up. So we've talked uh, about a relatively new class of attack that affects OSX. Pretty much affects everyone, it affects Apple applications, it affects third party utilities, and it abuses uh, legitimate functionality and it's fairly stuff. And using this attack, we can do all sorts of cool things. We can persist really stealthily, we can gain low time process injection, even on all copy time, we can bypass security products, and we can also facilitate remote infections. So until Apple fixes this, which they do or not, uh, I recommend scanning the system, make sure you're hijacked. Really doubt that you are, but can't hurt. Also, only download software over HTTPS. And if you see a company distributing software over HTTP, send them a little fancy email or something. And then, this is my personal opinion. I don't think antivirus products are worth paying money for. They cost money and they don't really affect anything. All right, so that's a wrap. Uh, we have two minutes for QA. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, email, slides available for download. I wrote a white paper about the technique for virus bulletins, so if you want to read all the excruciating technical details. Um, and check out objectivesc.com for your And also check out synac.com for an awesome company. So, that's it. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, some of the UI ones, not, but there are open source versions of Knock Knock and the Dialog Hijack Scanner. Those are on uh, Synax GitHub repository, so you can download and play with those. Well. Yes. Any other questions? Was? Ich habe nur sieben Knochen. Don't look. I have thousand skeletons getötet. Okay. Yeah. The question is, how does this impact iOS? So. I believe the, the code is kind of vulnerable because they share a lot of the same loader code, but because iOS does not allow you to run any unsigned code, that right there kind of blocks all the attacks. It only runs Apple signed code. So even if the, an application was vulnerable and you planted a malicious dialog, the loader would just ignore it because I'm annoyed. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes.
Fuck, falsch rum. Okay, ja, also Talk ist vorbei. Ähm, Video ist auch vorbei, würde ich sagen, hier. Dann äh, machen wir einen äh, kurzen Cut. Ähm, das Video war hier äh, DLL Hijacking on OS X und wir sind auf Laserbook Und ähm, ja, das war's mit der Folge.